Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning. Take off my old man glasses here so I can read this. Great job, pastors. Very encouraging. I, too, am uh, continually convicted by this as we uh, re-gospelize one another, as we gather together and again and again share the gospel. Uh, my name is Pastor Tim Dupre. Um, well, pastor is not my legal name. It's Tim Dupre, but I am a pastor. And I love you. I love each and every one of you dearly. And because I love you, I'm going to do my best to tell you the truth. The truth is I understand it. So I just have a few minutes, and I've been asked to give a pastoral perspective on abolitionism. Um, specifically, what I want to talk to you about today, and I'm going to be down in my manuscript because I've got 15 minutes, and I'm a long-winded. So I'm going to be down here. What I want to say to you is how do you know when you need to leave a church or stay at a church that isn't doing abortion ministry? How do you know you need to leave or how do you know you need to stay? Now, I can't really dive in deep, right? So I'm, it is what it is. Uh, myself and other pastors here will be available afterwards to give further counsel on it. Um, but I can talk about one of the major considerations that you must make in dealing with this question. And, and what I want to talk to you about, I have only heard whispered in the abolition community that I've newly been a part of for two years. The complaints and heartaches are plenty among us, but the solutions and direct talk from leadership about this question are not as common and understandably so because it's a tough question. It's a tough situation. It requires some development, some time, some counseling. If solutions are presented on a regular basis, I just haven't seen any. Okay, so they might be out there. People might be doing this, but I haven't seen it. The major consideration for this question will also hopefully be good information for you on any ministry, any ministry of need, that you find your church ignoring. So this just isn't about abolitionism, the solution I have. Um, it's also about any ministry of need that a church is ignoring. Um, other than that, I have two other smaller considerations to make when we, uh, to present when we think about this question. Earlier I said it's kind of whispered in our community, and I mean that in the sense that pornography and sexual immorality were once also whispered in the community of the church. They, were, they are huge problems in the church. They were then and they remain now. And we in the church, we've learned that in this area, we must take it head on from the pulpit, in the fellowship, in the families. We need to bring it out of darkness, bring it out into the light where godly expectation and godly accountability can take place. That's what we've learned. Fighting these sins behind closed doors, in small groups, in private confession is really good. That's good. But it will only do so much. We have to bring things out in the light. In the same way, um, during my last two years within abolitionism, knowing when to leave or stay with a church that is not taking part in this ministry of need it is talked about, but as I've experienced and seen with so many, it isn't talked about enough. It's not talked about enough with the same head on from the pulpit, in the fellowship, in the family, brought out of darkness, into the light, where godly expectation and accountability can, uh, accountability can take place way. We cannot play with or ignore hurts, and traumas and sins of those who are in ministries of need but are alone and are not being supported by the local church. We can't ignore it. The question of knowing when to leave or stay with a church needs to be talked about respectfully and openly, just like we do any other doctrine. We all in the church need to know how to know if we should leave or stay within a certain body. Sometimes this teaching needs to be forward, loud, impactful, and strong. And especially considering how many people go through this problem. 
But not to contradict myself, it must also be talked about with godly discernment and counsel. It must be talked about with gentleness and patience and hope and love. So as we dive into this question, here is the major consideration we must think about in figuring out if we should leave or stay within a church that is not doing a ministry of need. The church will take on the character and personality of the head pastor. And the head pastor has an important job as it pertains to the relationship he has with his flock. The pastor-disciple relationship, as you view it and as you see it and as you experience it, cannot be ignored. You cannot give a pass to men of God with how they live and how they disciple other people. It's one of their main jobs. You can't give them a pass. Is the pastor's or elder's leadership towards the Lord's disciples happening? Is that actually happening outside of the four walls on a Wednesday and a Sunday? There are other considerations to be made, but I, I want to focus in on this one in the very short time I have with you. Part of what hurts my heart so much as a pastor and as a new abolitionist, as I have came into this community with very healthy mentorship that I've had throughout my whole walk in Christ for 25 years, healthy mentors, godly people surrounding me. And as I've come into this community, we have all seen the very common pitfalls of those who are in abolitionism and in other ministries of need and the heartaches that they have. A lack of support from the church toward abortion and other ministers. A bitter heart sometimes. Can, am, am I speaking the truth here? Am I talking to you guys? All right, am I tracking? Are y'all tracking with me? You can get a bitter heart towards the church and towards its leaders. A lack of discipleship towards Christians from the pastors they serve. Uh, people in ministries of need like abolitionism are, are hard-charging, fiery ministers of the Lord. And sometimes they're just completely ignored in the discipleship relationship between their pastor and themselves. We have all heard or experienced the loneliness of a ministry in need, like, a, like abolitionism, like nursing home ministry, like foster care and adoption, like street preaching, many other ministries of need. But how much do we hear about the solution to the problems and not just the heartache? So here's one of the solutions to this question to consider. One of the pastor's main jobs is to walk through life with his flock Instructing them in the word of God, praying for them, and the world. In John 10, Jesus tells us he himself is a good shepherd. John 10, verses 11 says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And other than that, a deep spiritual significant analogy of Jesus as shepherd and Jesus as savior that we find in John chapter 10. From this chapter, we can also learn the characteristics of a good shepherd. A good shepherd in verse three speaks to his people. In verse four and five, he goes before the people and he leads them. A good shepherd in verses 7 and 12, he protects his people by standing in the doorway and ensuring that no wolves can come in and ravish them. In verse 9, he saves his people and he feeds his people. In verse 11, he will lay down his life for his sheep. In verse 12, a good shepherd is not a hired hand that will run or acquiesce in times of trouble. In verse 14, the good shepherd knows his people and they know him. They know each other's voice. And if we summed all of this up, I think we can sum it up in this phrase. I think this is what is meant by this phrase. A shepherd smells like his sheep. A shepherd smells like his sheep. And as I often do, as I consider my responsibilities as a pastor, I keep coming back to this. A shepherd smells like a sheep. That and study the word faithfully. Pray for my people faithfully. 
when I'm trying to focus my heart on what I am to do in my job, this doctrine brings me back to the support that I as a pastor must have for my sheep, for my people. A pastor must support the well-being of his people. Amen? A pastor must support the godly cares and concerns of his sheep. Not they must care and concern his, him. He's the shepherd. He must bring care and concern to them. A pastor must give support and direction to the various ministries of the sheep. The sheep are not sitting on their own, like watching the pastor do ministry. The sheep are ministering. And the pastor must support them in those ministries. How can any of this happen if an elder or a pastor does not know his people? How can any of this happen if a pastor does not smell like his sheep? And as I get into the high standard of pastoring here, and it is a high standard, no doubt, brothers, sisters, no doubt. Give your pastors mercy, please. <laughs> please, we need it. But as I get into the high standard here, we have to remember that all these do's and don'ts that I'm about to get into, this is for the entire elder team of your church. I'm not saying that every pastor must know every person, but every person must be known by a pastor. Whether you have one pastor or ten pastors, these things must happen. They have to happen. So here are some practical truths we can learn from this doctrine of the Good Shepherd. As a pastor and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, if you do not know where your pastor lives, and your pastor does not know where you live, there is a real problem in pastoring and discipleship. There's a real big problem. How do you know each other? Remember, the leadership and relationship the pastor has with his flock cannot be ignored. If a pastor doesn't support his people, does your pastor support you? If a pastor doesn't give godly counsel to his people, does your pastor counsel you? If a pastor doesn't pray for his people and their ministries, then there is no real discipleship and there is no real pastoring happened. That man is a hired hand getting a paycheck. Come see him on Wednesdays and Sundays. If you are involved in a ministry or not involved in a ministry, the pastor should have a word from the Lord on the subject for you. He should not be silent towards you. It's his job to let you know what God's will is. Remember, a good pastor speaks to his people. He goes before his people. He leads his people. He protects his people by standing in the door and ensuring that wolves cannot enter in. He saves his people and feeds them. How does he save them? We know Jesus does it, but he saves them with good doctrine. He lays down his life for his sheep. Is your pastor laying down his life for you? A good shepherd is not a hired hand. He knows his people and they know him. If a pastor is apathetic and silent to the needs, to your needs or to your failings or to your giftings or to your ministries, if he just, he doesn't talk to you about it, he doesn't support you, he doesn't give you words on it, then he is not a pastor, he's a hired hand and you should not follow him unless he repents. We all know the verse in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 and he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, Pastors, here we go. He gave pastors and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for what? For the work of the ministry. The saints are ministers. They're ministering. The sheep are working. And the pastor is there to equip them and help them. It's for the building up of the body of Christ. It's not the Isaiah curse of God judgment, God's judgment on a nation where he says, I will give you shepherds that only want to feed themselves. No, we are to be shepherds that feed others. As a pastor, one of the most important questions I ask myself, or excuse me, one of the most important questions we're asked as pastors, and it's a hard one, 
is what is God's will for me? It's a tough question that men of God need to give an answer to. And if you are in a church where the pastor is ignoring that question towards you, you're in a church where that pastor is not giving you what God's will is for you, and especially if you are ministering in an area of needed ministry, then he is not pastoring you. You are not being discipled, and you must consider leaving the church. Now, I didn't say leave the church. I said consider leaving the church. As I said on the outset, this is good information for any ministry of need, not just my church isn't doing abortion ministry. Here's the second consideration, two smaller ones. If you are in a church that has no ministry to what is needed most, whatever that ministry may may be, and if you have no position or influence there, so you have no position and no influence, no, no ability to bring more holiness to the body with your giftings. There's no place been made for you to use your giftings for the Lord, to use your discernment for the Lord. There's no place for you there. Then you should probably leave that ministry because you're not changing anybody. Apart from some word from the Lord or clear instruction, if you get that, do that. You know what I mean? If the Lord says stay, stay. But you must make a real assessment of your pastor and your church's faithfulness to real discipleship and ministry. If they are not doing these things and if you have no position or influence to change it, stop wasting your time and stop wasting the time of your disciples and your children and your families Stop wasting your time and go trust the Lord and find some Christians who want to fellowship with you on a regular basis, who want to support you, who want to do life with you, who want to do ministry together. If, if Kyle is my friend, if I lived here and I lived near Pastor Kyle, what he loved, if I was his friend, I would also have some level of love for it. Because that's friendship. We're not even talking about pastoring here. We're not even talking about the responsibility and the duty of men of God. I'm just saying he's my friend, therefore, I'm going to do some of the things he likes to do. Go find a pastor that cares for you and will not run away from the difficulties of helping you understand what is the Lord's will for me. If you have influence or position and you can bring holiness and change, then make a real assessment of it and maybe the Lord will lead you to stay there and to help these other saints as we also were once helped. But do not float. If God's calling you to leave, do not float. Do not miss Sundays. You must be on a diligent search. You cannot fall out. You cannot go out and pour yourself into street ministry without a pastor and without a fellowship. I mean, or I mean, what are you leading people to? If not, you're not being discipled and discipling others. What are you doing? You're just going to get them saved and then let them go? No, no, you got to live this life. So don't stop looking if the Lord calls you to leave diligently every Sunday. Find a body, find a people. Third consideration. If you are in a church where the pastor really doesn't teach others what he believes. If the pastor believes certain things and thinks certain things about you and abolitionism and ministries of need. And I had, I went to a church where two pastors believed in annihilationism and they never talked about it. And when I found out, I'm like, why don't you guys teach this? If you believe it, teach it. But if you're in a church where, where pastors, they're not really teaching others what they believe and they're playing some type of game, then third consideration, get another witness or get two more witnesses and go and try to lead that pastor to repentance. There's a way to talk to a pastor biblically. And as 1 Timothy 5.19 says in Galatians 6.1, summing them up with two or three others and in a spirit of gentleness, go and restore him. If that doesn't work, Pray, seek, and obey the Lord, whether it's leave or whether it's stay. In all things, be patient and kind, but not to the point of apathy, gossip, or a loss of hope. 
There are certain pitfalls in our community, and you have to guard yourselves from falling into them. Philippians 4, 5 through 7 tells us, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. So that's what you got to do in this process. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't lose hope for others. Keep yourself built up in the holy faith. Be prayerful, be wise, but be shrewd enough to know when you should leave or stay. This is no game. There is a work to do in the ministry. There is a work the sheep must be doing. And you need support. You need a body. And you need a pastor. You need people to hold you accountable. And you need the protection of a flock. It's important to stay committed to the local church because pastors cannot be the duty experts in every field. And you can't just remove all of your giftings and your discernments from the local church. You can't do that. So having a solid team, a family of faith around you and around the pastor is essential. And these are my final bullet points and two scriptures. Say amen for final bullet points and two scriptures. Don't ignore the issues. Talk about them respectfully. Make real assessments. Get godly counsel. Don't lose hope for others. When there is no repentance, don't waste your time and your family's time when you don't have a real pastor and real discipleship. Stay committed to the local church of Jesus Christ and to regular daily fellowship with other like-minded believers. Trust the Lord no matter the outcome, and we have this promise from the Psalms. It's a promise and a warning to let you know it's not a game. God provides homes for those who are deserted. He leads out prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious live in a scorched land. (laughs) Don't be rebellious right? Lastly, remember, do not ignore the relationship between a pastor and his flock. Your pastor must be a pastor that you can follow his way of living. A pastor smells like sheep. And as you consider these issues, also remember Hebrews 13, 7, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, we can imitate Jesus. He's the good shepherd, amen? Can you imitate your pastor? Can you live like he lives? Is he a good shepherd? If not, pray about your place and trust the Lord.